If you've been following, you'll know that we'd spent almost a month doing maintenance instead of riding. Now it was the first ride of the season. Normally the first ride would be an easy little romp on some of our favorite lazy trails. Instead we were lined up for the Classique. The Classique is one of the first organized rides of the season in our neck of the woods. To make matters worse, not only were we all rusty from a long winter, but we had changed a lot of things on these bikes and hadn't had any testing time. My ride to the start line was actually the only time I'd been on the bike, except for a quick trip around the block. Now back to the Classique, which is organized by the good folks at rideaventure.ca. There are three levels to suit any type of bike and any type of rider. We would be attempting the more aggressive of the three routes. The routes are classified based on a rating scale that is explained on the website. I'll throw up a couple of examples here of the, uh, of the different uh, type of terrain and the ratings that go along with it. These events usually follow a set pattern. Meet at the starting point, then there will be a general briefing. After that, you break into your smaller groups for a more specific briefing. Ours was being given by Mark, also known as G-String. Super nice guy and one of the organizers. He would also be leading our group on the uh, most aggressive route. During the briefing, it was mentioned that at some point we would come across a fallen tree that was blocking the trail, and also that there was gonna be a big hill climb that was gonna prove challenging, especially for the big bikes. I always feel a little nervous at the start of these rides. You're in a group with some good riders and not being the most skilled and also riding a big fat bike, I hate the idea of dragging the group down. We had spent the minutes before the ride started chatting with a bunch of different riders in the parking lot and it was actually kind of fun that some of them recognized us from our videos. On this particular route, we had some distance to cover on pavement before we hit the dirt. I think G-String's briefing about the big hill was weighing a little heavily on uh, Henrik's mind because when we stopped at a red light in a village, uh, Henrik was quizzing me as to whether or not he thought we were going to be able to make it up that hill. Initially I was feeling more confident because when we were all parked in the staging area, there was a lot of big bikes parked with us, 1150 GSs, 1200 GSs, and then when we split off into our group, I realized that none of them were coming with us. Yeah. So what, what happened to all the big bikes that were parked with us? What happened to all the big bikes that were parked with us? They seem to have vanished. <laughs> Where are they? I don't think they were in our group. Eventually the pavement ended and we were finally on gravel. After a short stint on the gravel, we regrouped to get ready to hit an actual trail. After a little screwing around with the menu system on Chris's GoPro, we got that sorted out and off we went. And I guess this is where the ride really begins. Now one of the problems with GoPros, especially if you have multiple GoPros, is that if you have two or three of them running all day, you can end up with an insane amount of footage. So more and more these days, we actually will maybe keep one running all the time and then just turn the others off and on when we hit an interesting section. This first section of the route was really nice. This is the kind of stuff that suits the bigger bikes. You've got a little room to wiggle around. You don't have to be so precise in uh, where you place your tire. And uh, it's a little more wide open, which means you can get on the gas. Although I gotta say, we were moving pretty slow through this section. It was feeling pretty odd to be standing up on the pegs for the first time in uh, quite a few months. And some of this uh, wetter stuff was actually quite slippery. Oh yeah, you'll also notice that the uh, the smaller bikes had pretty much vanished over the horizon at this point. We started getting our sea legs back, and I guess as far as trails go, this was probably the ideal way to uh, to start the season and get back into the swing of things. 
We also started to see in a few sections that there, there was still some snow. You could also get the sense that uh, the weather would really change how this ride would play out. It was a beautiful sunny day and it hadn't actually rained in a while, but I could see that if you, uh, if you were trying to do the route we were doing after four or five days of solid downpour, uh, this would be a real challenge, especially on the bigger bikes, and we probably would have opted to go for the uh, intermediate route at that point. Our little warm-up trail lasted a little less than five minutes, and then we were back on a dirt road. The dirt road eventually dumped us out onto some two-lane blacktop, and from there we had about 12-13 uh, minutes to go until we got to our next trail. In this case, the road didn't actually take us to a trailhead. It actually dumped us off onto a gravel road, and then the gravel road basically just continued to deteriorate until it turned into a trail. During the morning briefing, it had been mentioned that at some point we would come to a fallen log. When we finally arrived at the log, we, we could clearly see that we were going to have to lift our bikes over this. I got to pee. It was actually a welcome little stop because Chris also had to pee real bad. Henrik came up to me and mentioned that he was finding the pace a little fast for him. He was extremely rusty as the previous year he had barely ridden at all. Now what was interesting here is between our group and another group that showed up, we had about 20 bikes to get over this log. And here we were, most of us total strangers to each other, and with pretty much nothing being said, Everybody just jumped in and started hoisting bikes, and in a few short minutes, the whole thing was over. And I think this just shows you uh, the kind of interesting people that you meet when you get into this dual sport riding. You tend to meet people who uh, aren't afraid to uh, put their shoulder to the wheel and aren't whiners, which is always nice. Now when it comes time for a bunch of strangers to lift everybody's bikes over a fallen log, that's where being the guy with the 500-pound uh, F800GS makes you quite popular. Right. Now the bad news. After our success at the fallen tree, we all uh, got back in the saddle and headed back down the trail. Oddly enough, this was really the only spot in the entire day where we really encountered this much snow. We didn't complete the full route, so there might have been some other spots that we didn't see. But at least for us, this was really the only area where we were snowmobiling. Now this ride was at the end of April and in this part of the country, the end of April you never really know what you're going to get. Sometimes it can be very summer-like, sometimes we can still have snow falling. Uh, lately I've noticed that the Classic tends to be run a couple of weeks later in the season and that uh, increases your odds of having better uh, trail conditions. After a really nice section of trail, we ended up back on a dirt road. Eventually the kind of country road, cottage road, opened up into a hydro line. This looks amazing. We done this? I don't think so. Looks pretty amazing. The hydro line was fun, it was a bit mucky in sections, and there was one decent little water crossing. And Mark was nice enough to set up his video camera and get some shots of us crossing. And now I'll shut up for a while and you can uh, just ride along with us.
The exit from the hydro line was a bit tricky, and uh, I didn't choose the greatest line. Chris uh, found a better route off to the right. You could see the trail actually went straight ahead, but it was kind of flooded out. Um, so when it was after this exit, uh, I was starting to get the sense that we were slowing the group down quite a bit. It was taking us longer to get through some of these trickier sections. So I started formulating a plan that maybe at some point we would break off from the group because I'm sure they would, uh, they would prefer to proceed at a slightly faster pace. Once we popped out of the hydro line, we waited a little while till everyone regrouped and then we set off again on a trail that led off into this kind of scrubby wood. Um, you can see that it's pretty mucky and rocky. Uh, this is the kind of riding that, especially on a big bike, can be pretty tiring because you can't really get a rhythm going where you're just standing up on the pegs and letting the bike do the work. You're kind of manhandling the thing and you're pushing sometimes and you can't get your speed up high enough to uh, ride over obstacles so a lot of the times you're kind of rolling up to them and then spinning the tire to get over so this can suck a lot of energy out of you you'll notice once again that the guys on the smaller bikes are long gone so uh, yeah at this point it was becoming quite clear that we were holding those poor guys back here you're riding along with Chris on the HP2 and you can see now that the trail has uh, eased up a bit and now uh, Chris is able to get up on the pegs and get a little rhythm going and he's looking over his shoulder to make sure we're all still there another nice little mud hole frequently with these mud holes we try to stay off to the side because it's usually not quite as deep although if the banks are really sloped sometimes you can slide into the hole and then we sat here for a while waiting for uh, Henrik and Jason and uh, G-String came back you know, with G-String, we have the route. If you want, we can just split off. Yeah. yeah. So Chris and G-String headed back down the trail to see what was keeping Jason and Henrik. Uh, and at this point, we'd pretty much decided that we'd break off from the group and uh, let these guys go off on their own. Henrik and Jason eventually showed up. I'm not sure what was keeping them uh, back there. I know uh, at this point Jason was having some hard starting problems. Every time he stalled the bike, it was taking him a while to get it going again. And uh, on the walk back, uh, I think uh, G-String was telling Chris that, oh, yeah, don't worry about it, the, uh, the trail gets better from here on in. So we uh, wish G-String all the best, and now we were on our own. The trail did get a lot nicer, and it was becoming uh, very apparent that the organizers had put together a really nice route. And uh, the pressure was kind of off now too, because uh, we're used to riding at our own little pace and our own little group. So uh, now we would pretty much decided we would get as far as we could, and if we had to kind of jump on the main roads and get to lunch or whatever, we would do so. So now we got back into our own awesome players kind of pace of uh, riding and then standing around and chatting. And uh, yeah, this was a really, uh, this was a really nice section of trail and the weather was cooperating. It was beautiful and sunny. I think I was the only one who really had a functioning GPS. So when we got to this intersection, we stopped. Uh, you can see Jason didn't, uh, didn't buy the optional side stand for the KTM and uh, we decided to take a little break. Now the fellow here in the black riding uh, suit wasn't with our little mini group and he didn't have a GPS so he came back to ask and he said oh should I go right and of course I super confidently said no no look at my GPS you should go left. So uh, off he, he went <laughs> and of course that advice would turn out to be wrong so uh, certainly in this situation the awesome players weren't that awesome and uh, being a nice guy he was checking with Jason I think to make sure Jason was going to be okay and uh, I pulled up to tell him oh yeah we're used to uh, we're used to having breakdowns so uh, you get going we're good and uh, we'll take care of Jason we bid farewell to our friend who was off to I don't know where and uh, we took a moment to give Jason some time to get his bike started and then another group showed up and uh, we both confidently wave them on you could see a few of them were hesitant because they didn't seem to believe us and they were probably right not to do so but eventually our 
enthusiasm won them over and they all headed off down the trail. Henrik, oh. what's happening? I suck ass. That's what's happening. So we have split off from the main group due to the fact that we were traveling too fast? We split up from the main group due to, no small part, my inadequate skills. I would like to throw my inadequate squills into the mix as well. I rape think, whistle! I think it is time to sound the rape whistle. And so last night, Jason was up to his eyeballs in KTM parts. How long are you supposed to let the gasket dry? Three days. And Ooh. how long did you let it dry? Uh, Ten, hours. Ten hours. Oh, fuck, that's good. They must have a safety factor of seven. <laughs> right? Isn't that standard engineering practice? Sounds good to me. <laughs> so we're going to let her cool down a bit? Yes. That's Sounds what the like carb genius does. Aha. Adjust the carb, not knowing what the fuck he's doing. Yeah. The nice thing is you picked a lovely spot. Does it remind anyone for my, uh, remind you of my DR starting troubles? Yeah, except that was funny. <laughs> <laughs> hey, son! What's your secret? Patience. Hang on, guys. And no luck. Woo! Hang on. Woo! Nip on clock. The albino Hungarian mountain gorilla. <laughs> Notice the inflamed red buttocks. <laughs> So after a nice little break, uh, we headed down the trail and my GPS finally found out which way was north and that's when we realized we were going the wrong way and of course had sent everyone else the wrong way. Yeah, this was kind of a low point of the day for us and uh, we figured when we met up with the rest of the group later in the day, they would probably be less than excited to see us. Now, Jason hadn't owned this uh, 640 Adventure for very long, and later on he would come to find out that the starting problem had something to do with the Sprag clutch or something like that in the starter motor. And of course, uh, being a former BMW owner, he, uh, he kind of forgot that the bike had a kickstart, so he probably could have just kickstarted the bike uh, when it didn't want to start. After some more beautiful trail, we came to a little water crossing. Just go straight through, it's an inch deep! Don't stop, it's an inch deep! We sent Henrik across, and uh, much to our surprise, it actually was only an inch or two deep, so we decided to follow. So we continued on our merry way, and at this point, uh, Jason was out front, who doesn't have a GPS, and Henrik was following him, and of course Henrik doesn't have a GPS, and I was in uh, third position, and I think uh, Jason was navigating based on where the tire tracks were, and we so far that had been working out pretty well, but in this particular case we headed down this little trail, and uh, in short order it turned into a dead end. So we turned around, and then uh, without anybody really saying anything, I think we all decided that it might be a good idea if the fellow with the GPS went back in front. Missing a turn happens quite a bit, maybe more so with our group than others. Um, and, you know, frequently you, uh, you double back, and in this case there was this little offshoot to the right, and I drove right past it a second time, and it was actually Chris that kind of spotted it and uh, let us know that right uh, this looked ah. like the way and that's actually where the tire tracks went. So uh, Jason had already spun himself around and the rest of us decided to get sorted out. This next section of the route was a little different and uh, this is what passes for single track in our neck of the woods. Not the kind of thing I think you'd want to do on a big bike for 20 miles. But uh, certainly this little stint was nice and, uh, you know, it always kind of amazes you how the organizers managed to link all these sections together and find all these little connecting trails.
the trail eventually did open up a bit and dumped us back out once again onto a gravel road and within short order we caught up with another group that I think was uh, running the same route and then according to the GPS we had uh, quite a bit of actual real road to do so I won't bore you with that and we'll come back to the video once we get on the trail. Let's call this the tip of the day. I decided I wanted to pull over here and have a quick chat with Chris and I did so very gently because a few times in the past I've kind of jammed on the brakes and uh, caught Chris off guard and he's fallen so uh, I decided to be very dainty on the binders here. I slowed gently. I slowed down gently for you so you wouldn't crash into me. So that's that sand pit we went to that one time. Okay, before we actually get on to something long that's going to be off-road, I'll probably put some gas in then. Again? Straightening his steering. Now you might be wondering why does Jason need his steering straightened? Well, sadly the cameras weren't rolling and uh, Jason cooked it into a corner a little too hot and uh, laid the 640 Water. down but uh, bike and rider escaped unscathed. Sometimes when this happens, the, uh, the forks can get a little twisted in the clamps. So yes, we could have loosened all the uh, triple clamps up and uh, bounced the forks up and down and straightened it out. But at this point, we decided to just pretend it was a kid's bike and uh, clamp the front wheel between our knees and yank on the bars. And then we were back on the road. After a little more gravel, the route uh, took us down a trail that we'd only been on a couple of times before. Once when uh, a friend of ours, Mark, had taken us on a little uh, guided tour. And the only thing I remembered about this section of trail was that pretty much every time we had done it, there was a lot of water. Well, it didn't look like this time was going to be any exception. And after a couple of small little puddles, uh, we got into the bigger water and uh, yeah it's, a, it's always kind of fun going through the water I mean this wasn't crazy deep stuff and uh, there didn't seem to be a lot of uh, mysterious things waiting at the bottom of these some of the other water crossings we do uh, there's a lot of rocks and logs and other mystery stuff down there a lot of the times if you're the first guy through one of these sections and no one's been through in a while it's actually clear enough that you can see what's down there, but as you can see from all the tire tracks, uh, a lot of guys had been through here recently, so that water was pretty stirred up. We didn't have to wait very long, and the rest of the boys caught up, so off we went. Now this type of trail is really typical of the kind of stuff that's in our area. Uh, we're about an hour or so from Montreal, in Quebec, Canada, for those of you who are interested. And this is the kind of typical terrain we get. Uh, there's lots of muck. Um, some parts of the province are a little sandier than others. These trails tend to be snowmobile trails in the wintertime. And during the summertime, it's uh, actually the ATV clubs and the ATV riders who, who use these trails the most and maintain them and build the bridges and uh, some ATV clubs do allow motorcycles on their land and some trails like this one just don't seem to belong to any association they just seem to be on somebody's land who uh, doesn't seem to mind us using it here you can see a little rockier section And this trail continued for quite a while and eventually got wider and wider until uh, here it was almost uh, a road. 
I could see on my GPS that we were coming up to a real road, and uh, this man seemed to want to have a little chat. Bonjour. Oh, he's très bon. Ah, je ne sais pas quelqu'un m'a donné euh, des GPS points, mais euh, on n'avait aucun problème en moto. Alors euh, en quatre roues, ça serait très relax. <rire> ouais, ouais, ouais. Il y a un groupe de place, il y a de l'eau comme comme ça. Oh, mais même avec un roue motrice, <rire> ça passe. Bonne <rire> journée. Ciao. Now the nice fellow on the ATV just wanted to know. Uh what condition the trail was in up ahead and I mentioned to him that there was uh, some relatively shallow water and that if I could get through it with one wheel drive he certainly wouldn't have any trouble in four wheel drive. I decided to wait here and uh, let the group reform. In short order Chris arrived on the HP2 and Good. then uh, Jason on the 640 and Henrik on the Mighty DR. So after a quick lens clean, it was back on the 800 and uh, down the road. We ended up on a paved road and then I saw this hydro line to the right. And it's been a while since I was on this ride and I can't remember if I thought this was the route or if we just decided to do a little exploration because hydro lines tend to be a real source of, uh, of good riding for us. So we uh, headed off down the trail, and of course, uh, the nice thing about being the only guy with a GPS in the group is that you're pretty sure everyone's gonna follow you. Eventually it dawned on me that this was definitely not the route and not going in the direction that we wanted to go. So I swung a UE. And this is where you get to see head on all the quizzical looks from your compatriots who are wondering what the hell you're doing. And as we got back to the pavement, I could see another group of riders coming along. I'm not sure if this was the same group that we gave the uh, bad directions to, but they might have been wondering why we weren't on the route. So we waited for them to pass. And here comes Tail End Charlie. Oh, no, one more. And then we fell in behind them. Now this is one of the great things about going on these rides. We were approaching an intersection that we were quite familiar with, but yet the other riders in the GPS track had veered off to the left. And lo and behold, here was this kind of obscure little trail that we'd never noticed before. There was this little bit of space between the fence for the auto route and the edge of this embankment. And as you can tell from looking at the trail, there's still grass on it, which means it's not something that gets used all that regularly. And probably mainly because it would be a bit tight for an ATV and it's the ATV guys that tend to make the trails. But nonetheless, it was kind of fun to find uh, another nice little route uh, right next to some of our regular uh, riding areas. Now this little trail didn't actually go on for too long and of course when it ended we realized we could have just as easily kept going straight and uh, here was the tractor that we were following, so we didn't make very good time because uh, we were following him when we left for the trail, and now we fell right in behind him. Eventually, the route led us onto a road that we know very well. This is one of our uh, favorite riding areas, and it kind of eases you in to the ride, this road, because it starts off as a one and a half lane paved road. You really can't fly on this road. Uh, there's always a lot of sand and gravel in the corners and uh, because it's not a high traffic road, the locals tend to not think someone's going to be coming along so you can kind of find people parked in the middle of the road having a conversation. 
Eventually the pavement peters out into a gravel road and finally the gravel road turns into a dirt road. A dirt road that's not super challenging depending on the last time it was maintained there can be some decent ruts and erosion some sections can have some puddles nothing more than a foot or so deep but on this particular day the road was in very nice shape on this stretch we caught up to a couple of guys in four-wheel drives and after following them for a little while, they noticed us and uh, let us pull by. And we always make an effort to be nice and say hi. And one thing's for sure, we try to make sure as we're passing them, we don't toss up any rocks. The lead guy here was going a little bit faster. Eventually, he found a nice little spot to pull over and uh, also let us by. One thing about being more out into the, the countryside like this, people seem to have a lot less issue with ATVs, motorcycles. I mean, these are not uh, cottagers, a lot of these people. A lot of these people are people who live out here and they own ATVs and they actually use their 4x4s to get places and do things. And... Uh, that different attitude sometimes is quite apparent. Now when up ahead I spotted a third vehicle, I started thinking something must be up because 99% of the time we do this road, we do not meet a soul. Uh, let alone see three guys in five minutes. So as I fell in behind this guy, I started thinking that there must be something up. And then, up ahead, at our little sand pit, I could see that there was some sort of a gathering. And as I got closer, I could see it was a, an ATV UTV love-in at one of our favorite spots, the little sand pit. So we managed to squeeze through. Lots of people standing around having adult beverages. And, uh, of course, it looks like we're not the only people who like to play in the water. Yeah, these boys seem to be uh, having a good time, so we just pulled right into the middle of them, flicked out the side stand, and decided to see what was going on. Looks like we stumbled upon a parquet! Over the years, I've kind of noticed that there's a bit of a love-hate relationship between ATV ears and motorcyclists. I think part of it stems from the fact that when we do meet them on the trail, we tend to be moving a little faster than they do. These non-sport ATVs, like this guy's riding here, tend to plod along pretty slowly, especially on rough terrain. So when we catch up to them, we're kind of putting a bit of pressure on them, I think. And when we come head on, I think they see us as moving a little too fast. Then we were met by another awesome player from another group who wanted to know where the rest of our group was. We explained that uh, we were moving a little too slow and had uh, broken off. And then he, uh, he thought he better get moving so he didn't get separated from his group. Eventually it was time to go and Henrik took the lead since we knew this area quite well and forged ahead into the mud. And I think it was a little bit deeper than he was anticipating. But he made it and I think uh, he impressed the uh, the audience. Then it was my turn, and of course, now that I actually knew how deep them. the water was, I figured I'll be the guy who falls down and really impresses them. So at this point, uh, discretion being the better part of valor, I decided that uh, I would bypass this little swamp hole to the left. We uh, daintily threaded our way through the uh, partying uh, ATV ears. They pretty much didn't seem to acknowledge our existence, <laughs> so we, uh, we made tracks and uh, got out of there. Now, 
there were a few bikes there at the sand pit with the ATV guys, but they seemed to be motocross bikes. Now this part of the trail we're very familiar with since we've ridden it many, many, many times. And uh, that was kind of nice. It was kind of uh, kind of relaxing to know what was going to be up ahead for the next few sections. Well, according to this, this is the way we should be going. Okay. The trail winds through the woods. There's uh, some decent elevation changes. And eventually, it dumps you on to this uh, gravel bed which uh, I can only assume is an abandoned uh, railway line. We caught up to a couple of ATVs at one of our favorite obstacles. This is the one we call the pipes. Watching the ATV guys do it, uh, it didn't look all that rough. There are some kind of slimy rocks in it, and if you try to go to the right-hand side, uh, the water there can be about four feet deep, so it's not recommended. I'm not quite sure what I was trying to do here. There's really two off. ways to approach this obstacle. Either you go very slowly well, and okay, you paddle actually. your way across, and then, of course, you don't have enough momentum to get over any of these slippery little rocks and you end up spinning the tire and pushing and you can also potentially fall over. The other way to do it is to roll in gently and stand on the pegs and feather the clutch and have some momentum and have a have some faith in your machine and in your own skills. Here you can see I just stalled it and that would have probably been the better way to have done this. And as you can see here too, we have the benefit of the water being clear, so you can actually see where There's the obstacles are. a big rock are. here! I pointed out that one big rock that was partially hidden in the muck, and eventually, a little clutch abuse and some wheel spin oh, made it out. my feet are fucking wet! Now the first thing you want to do when you get past an obstacle like that is get your bike on the side stand, get that ignition off, and run back to try and get some footage of someone else, hopefully, falling in. Where are the boys? Well, Chris Woo! didn't seem to have uh, taken the master approach to this obstacle either. And uh, oh, knowing how much Chris likes getting his feet wet, I'd say that was a not very successful crossing for Chris. <laughs> Here. To make matters worse for Chris, <laughs> we waited quite a while and none of our fellow riders had shown up and we were a little bit we mystified to, to how anybody could have gotten lost on this trail. Water. So Chris went back to look for them. Here he got the benefit of crossing the water a second time. But I guess once your feet are wet, it doesn't matter. And then it dawned on me I should probably hustle myself back to the bike and get the uh, handheld camera so that uh, I could get some better footage of our buddies crossing that little obstacle. Go that way! Sure enough, in short order they arrived. Henrik Jason. almost went to the right-hand side, which would have been a disaster because that water was about four feet deep. Here we see Jason on Big O. Now Jason's a tall guy, and you can see uh, that's a tall bike. It's a big rock! I mentioned that there was a big rock there, but you know, being a KTM, I don't think Jason uh, worries about obstacles. Now, there was no way for Henrik to kind of push this bike backwards by himself with all the slimy rocks there. So, uh, Chris had to wade in and lend him a hand. Now, you can see there, I mean, that water's clear, but that's... How deep? That's four feet deep. Maybe not yeah. four feet deep, but it's three feet deep. That would have been... Not good. Good video. <laughs> Henrik, know it! Gun it! That would have been the shot of the century. Now this probably would have gone a little faster if 
Jason and I had lent a hand, but uh, Chris is Henrik's brother-in-law, and uh, sometimes it's best to just let family work things out amongst themselves. Now, the DR is not the tallest of bikes, but Henrik also does not have the longest of legs. So I think it was a good thing that Chris was holding on to the luggage rack while Henrik mounted up. And uh, after pushing the magic button, the mighty DR sprung to life. Briefly. Now you can see that the rear hub is totally submerged, which means uh, Don't there's a good a chance that uh, Henrik will be Don't give a changing some wheel bearings in the coming winter. Uh oh. Now I've been riding with Henrik at this point for uh, three seasons, and if there's one sound I'm quite familiar with, it's the starter there. motor yeah. of a DR650. Well, it just started a minute ago perfectly, the first time. Kill switch is out. Yeah. Side stand is up. Yeah. Side stand is up. Yeah. Clutch in. Neutral. Huh? Neutral. Yes. Okay, hold it wide open and crank it. Wide open? Yeah. Stop and wait, wait okay. for the battery to retard. All right. Douche rope! <laughs> the only real bikes, BMWs. Well, the motor's getting cooled. There you go. Look at that, it is water-cooled, Henrik. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you have minnows underneath your bike. Hey, you can't move now, you're officially a spawning ground. Yeah. <laughs> All right, here she goes. I got a good feeling about this. Gas? No, just, yeah, just try it and see what happens. She wants to. Should I give you a choke? You could try it, I don't, shouldn't. I think it's time, Bill. Really? Yeah. I put the rope on your left side on the top. I love carburetors. Bring out the I douche rope. rope. <laughs> Henrik, you know why do we know? call it the douche rope? Um. It's after the individual who keeps it at his house. <laughs> mm -hmm. You think we can pull it without getting wet? Yeah, we are. <laughs> I know it. You have a long enough rope, I can. Hey, look at that! The look the at the fucking fish! Yeah. Holy shit! Big ones. Yeah. Holy shit! Those are some okay, fair-sized so fish. What? What? For what? For what? The non-starting doucheness of this whole situation. That's that. Uh -oh. After seeing the fish, Chris threw in his line and he missed on the first Away. cast. Away. But on the second cast, Put it on he your caught a Hungarian. In the middle of your handlebars, Henrik. Hang on. I guess I would need to get off the bike, don't you? Think? No, 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 no. Right there. Wrap it around the top bar. Click it. I click it on. Okay, then nous autres la corde de. Have you ever fished for douches before? <laughs> no. <laughs> this is my first time. Now. Wait, wait. Okay, get off. <laughs> Move it. Move it, Bill. You should get on this side because this is the side we're pulling. Oh. Yep. Go around. No, no, just let me lead it towards me. Oh, I fuck. Okay. Get the other side. <laughs> There's also uh, a big fucking rock right in front of your tire. Henrik is doing the walk of shame. And as usual, we see Chris okay, being go. very careful not to wet his feet. His feet are already wet. Wait. Come on. Oh. Oh. 
Is it in hot? Hey, did you take it out of gear? It's not in gear. Hey! It's not in gear. No, 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 no. You're pulling me on. Fuck, someone has to go into the water. Chris. <laughs> You owe me a case of beer now. You owe me a case of beer now. Yep. Good. You didn't put so much fucking gas in this thing. Go on right there. There's a big run right there. Douche power! Go to the left! Now, of course, I would have gladly lent a hand, but uh, sadly, I had to run the camera. And here you see Chris's happy, smiling face. <laughs> <laughs> He's your relative. Jason, yes, earlier sir. there was an, an incident on the road. Man, no. I just decided I wanted to take a nap in a, a turn. Sadly, we didn't get it on video, so you'll have I know. to describe it. Some wankers aren't actually putting their cameras where they're supposed to be. Get out of your asses, dude. So how did it work? What, what washed out? The front tire washed out? The whole bike, I, I leaned it over until it... I, I, you had to lay her down. Yeah. <laughs> Actually did. I don't know, but I want to hear about your date last night. <laughs> what hap uh, happened to the bike? There was gas in the airbox. Flooded. Yeah, flooded. 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 Empty your bladder, and then we'll empty the airbox. Will you just undo the pole? So, Henrik. Yeah. Uh, show us the photo you sent into that Hungarian dating site. <laughs> 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 and how many men responded? <laughs> oh, that's sad. <laughs> yeah. I think once we get out of here, we should probably DD Mao to lunch. Yeah. Otherwise, we're going to miss it. Yeah, I don't want to miss lunch. I'm really. Okay. Is that Scotch Road over there? Yeah. Somebody's got a big V-twin. Okay, Henrik. Yeah. Is it time? Time for what? To pull the fucking seat, squeeze out your air filter. I mean, what else could it be? There can't be any more. There can't be anything. Let's other yank than that. the seat and take a look at the filter. After waiting a while, the mighty DR sprang back into life. We're not quite sure what was wrong with it, but eventually it started, and then uh, Henrik noticed the idle was really crappy. I suspect probably the air filter was all wet, and he tweaked the idle a bit, and then it was time to get rolling again. It was actually starting to get really warm now. Henrik! You should have worn more layers! Luckily, Henrik had worn his Killy jacket, which is uh, famous for being very sweaty. Anyways, now that all the bikes were running again, it was time to uh, get the hell out of here. Now this part of the trail, uh, we've ridden this quite a lot and uh, we knew that up ahead should be relatively smooth sailing. So uh, off we went. Now after the pipes, there's another little water crossing, which usually is just a little trickle a couple of inches deep. But this year I could see that there'd been some erosion and it was actually quite deep and I got a little too hard on the binders and stalled it. So once I got the bike restarted, I tried to go, but one of the things with this type of uh, kind of river rock is 
It's really easy to spin your tire and just dig a hole. And at this point, your best bet is just to get off the bike, stand in the nice cold spring runoff, and uh, a combination of pushing and uh, a little clutch abuse. I stalled it again. The F800 doesn't have a lot of flywheel effect. And eventually made it out. And then, of course, once again, the first thing you do when you get past an obstacle like this is you try to hustle over as fast as you can, get out of the way, get that bike on the side stand so that you can hopefully get some footage of your buddies uh, falling down. Sadly, Jason made it through without any drama. Henrik made it through without any drama. And Chris, you can see it's a little, a little deeper. That's quite a bit deeper than usual. Chris made it through without any problem. Probably air filter's wet. Henrik's DR still wasn't idling all that well. And now we were uh, definitely running quite a bit behind schedule and it was time to get moving. We hadn't gone very far when I noticed that uh, my trusty Garmin wasn't telling me which way to go. And initially I couldn't figure out what was going on and then it dawned on me that uh, the route we were on had ended. Uh, a lot of the times the way these rides are, are designed is as opposed to one no, big long multi hundred kilometer long route, it's broken into sections. And uh, this was the end of one of the sections and I had to kind of manually swap to the next route. The trail eventually turns into a pretty decent road and from here on till we'd actually hit uh, a paved road there's not really anything super challenging. There's one little hill climb that depending on the state of the road you can see it's a little bit rocky right here and up ahead there's one little hill climb that can be uh, a little rough if there's been some erosion but here you can see it was actually in pretty good shape today and luckily you know nice thing about being on a bike as opposed to in a four-wheel drive or an ATV is you can pretty much pick and choose a narrow little route and avoid a lot of the nastiness So after a brief meeting on the side of the trail, we decided that uh, we would just head directly to lunch. Um, I think the next section of this route was actually supposed to be pretty rough. I think uh, Mark had mentioned that there might be some towing with a rope and stuff, and at this point we were already running late. We decided to just grab some gas and uh, get the hell out of Dodge and try to make some time and get to lunch. Now the GPS I'm using here is my old Garmin 276C and uh, it has since died but one of the things I really liked about this GPS had a big screen and it actually had buttons instead of a touch screen right to which was really nice when you were wearing gloves and then when the GPS was all dirty and mucky you weren't grinding away at the screen with your uh, dirty hands I mean yes you can put a screen protector but I've got to say I I still miss my old 276 When we stopped for gas, the DR still wasn't idling very well. So uh, I decided to give it a shot. I'm always willing to tweak someone else's carburetor. Worst case scenario, I get on my own bike and it's fuel injected and I drive away. Now we were on a pretty much administrative move just to get to lunch and uh, we were zipping down this nice gravel road. Some sections the gravel was a little loose and I got caught napping here and ended up swinging a little wider than I wanted to in that corner. But luckily I could see up ahead that nobody was coming. Otherwise I probably would have had to take the ditch on the left side to avoid getting squished.
Eventually, we arrived at our lunch destination, Fort West. And uh, we kind of noticed that uh, we weren't exactly in the midst of a lot of other people showing up. We hadn't actually seen any other bikes on the main access road for quite some time. And then when we turned the last corner, it uh, became quite apparent why we hadn't seen anybody else. Because everybody was already there. One of the things about uh, our group's approach to riding is uh, we tend to spend perhaps a little more time standing around and chatting than uh, other groups. Uh, some guys really want to lay down the miles in any given day and I guess uh, sometimes we spend a little more time socializing. Here you can see everybody gathered and uh, lunch, I believe this day, was being provided by our uh, local BMW dealer. Henrik decided right away the little nap was in order. Okay, Chris, yeah. punch him in the nuts. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Now you can see that trail in the background to the right of that sign. Uh, that trail would figure prominently a little bit later in the afternoon and if you notice there's also some bikes back there they were uh, filming an episode of a local uh, motorcycle TV show and they were goofing around over there everybody was kind of wondering what those guys were doing there across the hydro line you could see they weren't making too much progress By cutting our morning ride short, we had uh, missed out on what were apparently some really nice sections of the trail. So uh, Mark had uh, explained to us that we could probably run some of the route backwards and get to you know, experience some of the better parts that we'd missed. All we had to do to kind of jump back onto the trail was cross this mucky field and get up this relatively steep hill. And of course, this was the mucky field that we'd been watching a bunch of guys struggle with while they were shooting that TV show. Here I'd forgotten to close my tank bag, so I took a moment to stop and zip it up before all my worldly possessions were scattered to the four winds. And up ahead, I could see Chris trying to stay out of the muck by staying on the grass, but in some places actually even though it looks like you might want to veer off the trail and uh, stick to the grass, the grass was actually really soft. This road actually seemed to have at least some foundation to it. So here I was able to skirt to the right a little bit and then I could feel myself sinking in so I got back on the road. And uh, yeah, this was not looking super promising. And you never know, you get into that sloppy stuff and sometimes you can just stay on the gas and the bike chews its way out. And other times you don't make much headway, but up ahead when I saw Chris was stuck on the HP2, I, uh, I took that as a real bad sign. Seeing as the groove that Chris was in uh, was really deep, I decided to go left and try and get up on what looked like some firmer ground, but I never got enough momentum going to get out of this little groove and uh, got nicely stuck and I don't know what this stuff was. It wasn't just mud because it smelled horrible. In looking at the video now, I realize that we should have made the decision much farther back to stay to the left side of the trail. And then I think we probably could have sailed through this with not too much drama. Uh, Chris was looking like he was probably going to need the douche rope to get out of there. I motioned to Jason to like try to cross over and uh, he gave the guns to Big O. And this stuff was pretty slippery so even with brand new knobbies he wasn't getting too far and needed a little tug. And the 640 chewed its way out and then it was uh, Henrik's turn. Now I was kind of telling him like you're going to have to get a little momentum to get in and out of this little groove. And he got high-sided, and with those short legs, he was down in the muck. You're okay. 
I think Henrik was feeling a little wore out at this point. Hold it. Hold it. Ready? Go. Now at this point you can pretty much give up on staying dry and staying clean. So I jumped in, helped Henrik lift up the mighty DR. And now I just hope that it was going to start and uh, the motorcycle gods were smiling on us and the DR sprung to life. And with Henrik pushing and me running the controls... Uh, once I got it started a second time, we, uh, we got the mighty DR out. Up ahead, Jason had managed to uh, help Chris extricate the HP2. And then, the only machine to uh, need recovery at this point, thankfully, was the Featherweight F800GS. Well, now we had all the bikes unstuck, we were all a little bit uh, worn out, and all we had up ahead was this really gnarly hill climb. Okay, so what's the story here? I decided I wanted to walk up and at least take a little bit of a look. Uh, it's always kind of nice to get a bit of a run at these things. You really don't want to stop at the bottom and look. You kind of want to roll into it with a little bit of momentum. Any and I can see that... Uh, it wasn't looking all that great. Looked like I could probably get through the slop here on the left and then hopefully keep a little bit here, of speed boys. up to get up that hill. You could see back there where everyone was having lunch, so we I hope we were putting here. on a bit of a show for them, falling down and getting stuck and all that. Oh, I smell gas. Stay to the left, I think. Now, how high we climb here? All the way up? Okay, let's go. Is your bike running, Jace, or it needs a rest? I'm going to go on the left. It looks like I was going to be the first one to attempt the hill. Sometimes I actually prefer that. You know, you see somebody else go up and you see them get bounced around and uh, maybe fall and it kind of freaks you out. Now here I am driving on this grass and it looks solid, but with the weight of uh, the 800 with me on it, I was sinking in and as soon as I touched the gas, I started digging a trench and at this point you might as well stop. You're just making it harder to get out, and Henrik uh, grabbed a crash bar, and with a little manpower, I got going. As his reward for being a good Samaritan, Henrik got uh, sprayed with that stinky muck. My dream of having a nice rolling start uh, was now dead, and up I went. You don't really see it too well, but there was this diagonal kind of trench right here with this log going across the trail, and then some good-sized rocks. At some point, the front wheel got deflected, and I headed right over here to the left side of the trail and came pretty close to heading down that embankment. And then experience has taught me just to stand up on the pegs and stay on the gas and try to keep the bike pointed in the general direction you want to go. And odds are that old 800 of its own kind of free will will just get you to the top of the hill. Then it was Chris's turn. He uh, managed to make it through the sloppy stuff. And uh, you can see here he's carrying a little more speed. His camera's at a better angle. Here's this little trench, which was actually quite a bit of a dip. Some nice rocks. Now those rocks, if you don't have enough speed and you bounce off a couple, it can really suck the momentum out of you. And then you just come to a dead stop. And it's pretty hard to get going 
when one of those big rocks is in front of your rear wheel. You can see my tire tracks swerving all over the place. Chris uh, made it a little straighter. Oh, Henrik's gonna have a hard time with that. And uh, now it was time to take off the helmets and get ready because we were pretty much figuring yeah. there was gonna be a little muscle involved in getting everybody up this hill at this point. Yeah, when I, when I saw that first dip, I'm like, oh, that's not so bad. And then I saw the giant fucking rocks. <laughs> Holy shit. This was steep. Whew, I'm walking down this hill and it is slippery. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I'm surprised the old 800 made it up. Now I know I keep saying that the camera really doesn't show how steep these hills are, but if you look down here, you can see Jason, who's a big guy at six foot two, and uh, Chris, who's about six foot four, and when the two of them are trying to push a bike that weighs as little as a 640 Adventure, and that bike with nobody on it is spinning the tire, um, that's a steep hill. And I figured uh, I'd better lend a hand, but uh, this didn't look like the kind of thing we should leave undocumented. So here we are trying to uh, use nature as a tripod. And uh, you can see the boys uh, got it up one of the steeper, rockier sections. Sorry for the real bad camera work here. And then at that point I just gave up and decided to put the camera down on the ground. And with all of us working together, we, uh, we managed to get the 640 going to a spot where we thought it would probably work for Jason to uh, hop on board. And now if you could just get started, if, if, as long as you can get enough speed that you can get up on the pegs, uh, you can probably make it, but it's just, you know, getting enough of a run without hitting a little obstacle, it's kind of hard to make that transition from seated to standing when uh, you're only going uh, two miles an hour. You got to get up enough speed for that bike to get stable. So Jason was ready to go and we gave him a boost and uh, off he went. Now, all that remained was the mighty DR. In the distance, you could see the rest of the group still basking in the sun and enjoying their lunch as Henrik walked back to the mighty DR. Here you can see the little ditch. It was fun. If you were a betting man? If I was a betting man, I wouldn't be betting. <laughs> Holy crap. That's a long one. Stay on the pegs! I think I'm gonna spot him. On that side? This side. Okay. Keep her going, don't slow to go, 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 go! Okay. Let's through the dirt and we'll be better off. Yeah. Okay. They win. Drag the front over. Hold on, Chris, drag the front over, he's right on a rock. No, no, I got you. There you go. All right. Hang on. You got to stay to the right. Holy shit. No. You got it. We got you. All right. You're almost a little left. Put your foot on this big rock. Okay. You okay? Yeah. I tried to catch it. 
Good. Oh. Woo! Uh, he's busted. Of course. A moment of silence. Everything else is good. Whew. Always pack out your trash, boys. Okay, anything? Pet talk's good? Pet talk's good. Hang on. No leaks. Okay, we're good. So, um, we have swing to swing the ass around. Yeah, we have to turn the ass around a little bit, and, and then we'll brakes on, pull the ass around. You got it? Yeah. Hang on. Oh. I got the handlebars, Henry. Right. One more. Pull the front around. Roll it back way. Uh, there's a rock behind it. Okay. Okay. Oh, it's in gear. Hang on. Clutch is in. Now at this point, you might as well just resign yourself to the fact that uh, it's going to take a bit of muscle and a bit of time. Take your helmet off, have a drink of water, and with everybody uh, chipping in, we know we're going to get this bike up that hill. And instead of trying to start in the really crappy position, you're better off spending a little time manhandling the bike, getting it straight, making sure there's not any obstacles directly in front of either of the tires. And that's going to make this whole operation go a lot smoother. Hold on. Anything broken? This is good nope. Uh, and you oh, can't go backwards because you've got the mother of all rocks. Okay, good. Going anywhere. Okay. Now, may I be so bold as to make a kind of suggestion? Yes. Why don't we get Chris to ride it up with this game and fuck it like? You ride it up. I can't reach the ground. I think that'll be 99% of our victory. You want to get your helmet? Yeah. Oh, not putting your Unless sweaty helmet on. <laughs> that was the other option, and it's not a good one. Unless you want to give it another go, Bill. The thing is, it's really steep. Can get momentum going, and I need to paddle. Okay. And when it comes to paddling... Okay. Grab my helmet! Bring Chris's helmet! Remember, Chris, this is not your bike. Ride it appropriately. Hold on, is your helmet ready? It's also looking down. That's great. Come on, Bill. See, he got a little bent out of shape hey, there. Okay, yes, lo. But uh, managed to save it. There is no fucking way I'm coming back here. Now this is pretty rough. Give her! And after firing the mighty DR back to life again, it was smooth sailing right up to the top. Henrik? Yeah. Your bike is up the hill, Bill. Yeah, minus, minus one turn signal. <sighs> G-string, G-string said this was the only nasty part that went to gravel road. <sighs> so if... And there's beer at the end of the road. <gasps> okay, can we make an agreement the first place that sells beer we stop? Really? I want to do more of this. Well, go down while we're waiting and come back up. <laughs> <laughs> Now, one of the things I really don't like about dual sporting is that long walk up the hill after you've helped yeah. someone down at the bottom get unstuck. And, uh, yeah, at this point I was feeling pretty whipped. Needed to stop and uh, have a drink of water. I think Henrik was uh, pretty close to being done at this point. But... Uh, we had it on good intelligence that that was really the last big obstacle 
of the day for us and that after this it should be relatively yeah. easy uh, gravel roads. So after taking a bit of a break and uh, letting Henrik catch his breath and have a have some water, we set off again and we were actually a little surprised to find out that this hill climb wasn't quite over. That there was still quite a bit of it to go. It wasn't quite as steep or as nasty as the first section. But uh, yeah, this was a really uh, this was a really interesting trail. After that little hill climb, uh, the trail actually turned into probably the perfect kind of trail for us. Nothing too challenging, the occasional little spot where it was rutted or loose, uh, some decent little hill climbs, a little bit of rock, but uh, considering this was after lunch and everybody was getting a little tired, it was probably a good thing that the, uh, the hardest parts of this ride were behind us. Eventually. We stopped on the side of the trail to have a little powwow, and uh, once again, if you're the only guy with a GPS, okay. uh, it's probably going to fall to you to uh, lead the way. And at this point, uh, Henrik mentioned that he was now on reserve. He does have a massive tank on that DR650, but ever since he put that flat slide carburetor on it, his gas mileage has been atrocious, so I'm imagining he was running quite rich. So we uh, poked around on the old Garmin for a while, until it looked like we found a way out, and off we went. Gravel eventually gave way to asphalt, and at this point, uh, the siren call of the ice cold beer was starting to uh, get pretty loud in our collective ears um, and it really had turned out to be a beautiful day I think when we uh, when we left in the morning we were you know freezing our butts off and now it was actually kind of hot and dusty uh, Henrik had kind of taken the other approach so in the morning I think he was pretty toasty in his uh, Kilimanjaro his stitch pants and his leather gloves and then he paid the price for that uh, later on when uh, it got a little warm but uh, we weren't quite out of the woods yet my GoPro batteries were both dead and uh, here we are riding along with Chris on the HP2 he was the only one who still had any juice left in his GoPro when all of a sudden we noticed that uh, the mighty DR had sputtered to a stop on the side of the highway what's the situation Henrik all right. Oh, that's a lot of gas. Well, it's stuck in this lobe, that's all. Okay, all right, let's put it over this way. Yeah, turn it around and then we can lean it down the hill. Yeah. Now the DR only has a petcock on one side of the tank, just like a KLR and a lot of other bikes. So one of the things you can do is turn the bike upside down and slosh all that gas from the wrong side onto the petcock side. And in this case, that should be uh, quite an amount. We were hoping it was going to be enough to get us to a gas station. Right. Can you shut off the okay, that should do it. How far is the gas station? Uh, you got loads of gas now. <laughs> it's not far. You can see here Henrik was looking a little worse for wear, but uh, he's a trooper and we knew he'd suck it up and get it done. So uh, Jason, who was more familiar with this area than the rest of us, seemed convinced that maybe three or four or five kilometers down the road there was going to be a gas station. We weren't that worried. We had uh, a couple of other bikes with plenty of gas in the tank. We have a siphon hose and... Uh, Worst case scenario, even if the batteries in Chris's GoPro went dead, we still had the Sony Handycam in my tank bag to document it all. 
Well, the gas station was a little farther than we thought, and within short order, we were once again standing on the side of the road with a dead DR. How far is it? Let me go look. I have a water bottle, I can just fill up with gas. So at this point, we decided to take a two-pronged approach to solving this problem, and uh, we sent Chris on up ahead to do a little reconnaissance and actually get a hard number on how far we had to go to get gas. And meanwhile, we were going to uh, grab some gas out of the big tanks on the 640 and fill up Henrik's bike. We actually found a handy dandy discarded water bottle in the ditch and uh, that became our certified fuel container. Uh, it was kind of dirty, but uh, after the first couple of fills into Henrik's tank, uh, the, the cup got uh, remarkably clean. Here we are at the Awesome Players gas station with its owner, Jason. It's been lugging around all this extra fuel for the rest of us for the whole day, just in case. <laughs> it is now high test. The good news is that water bottle is now clean. Very clean. Yeah. Yeah. Should have actually uh, swashed it, sloshed it around a bit first. <laughs> we'll know for next time. <laughs> La -la. Oh, I think now, I if you burn this much gas in so few kilometers, something me. 300 right. kilometers. And How you didn't meters? have a full tank. Well, the tank was full to about here, well, so I think it takes. How many liters? I think it takes about six liters per 100 kilometer. That's not bad. Well, remember, give a hoot, don't pollute. It was already there. <laughs> it's in. It's a mile down the road. Okay, we have topped him up from the Valdez. Exxon Valdez gave you gas. Yep. Wow, the truck pulled up right next to you. Uh-huh, yep. All right, let's rumble. We live. Give us the wrap up. Uh, Jason got so bored with driving on the road, he just shot off the road. Yeah. That is spectacular. <laughs> and nobody got it on camera. I saw it though. You saw it? There was a camera. Phone. I was turning. It was off at the time. Describe it, Chris. What happened? I just saw Jason coming around the corner, and then all of a sudden he decided to step off the bike and let it slide through the corner. <laughs> Pretty much. What happened? No side of it. You see Blaming these really the nice high tech boots? Yeah. 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 Well, they actually. <clears throat> see how yeah. big they are? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, they, at the moment, uh, the complete lack of uh, skill on my part. It makes it so that once every, I don't know, three attempts, I miss the, the brake pedal. I can't find it. Ah. Um, well, it wasn't time to be searching for the gas for the <laughs> brake pedal. So you decided to use the side corner. of the bike as the brakes? Well, Flintstones method usually works. Nice. But I forgot that they have really wide tires. <laughs> uh, yeah. But at least I got my first uh, reel down. Yeah. You got that out of the way. Yeah, and it doesn't even hurt. Well, Wait till tomorrow. We'll <laughs> yeah, tomorrow. It's tomorrow. Right, Henrik? <laughs> Do you think you're going to be hurt tomorrow? No, but after he had his Valkyrie crash. It's hurting the next day? The next day, and when I had my spill last summer, I got up on the side of the road. I thought, I'm 100%. We went for breakfast. The next morning, I went to get out of bed. Oh, I'm 100 years old, and I've fallen down the stairs. <laughs> So Henrik, that crash you had on the on the Valkyrie, yeah, you think that uh, impacted your confidence? My confidence How comes out of focus? or my confidence? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, because I noticed that you were going much slower than the year before. No, I don't think I was going. The, the year before, I was going just as slow on the DR. Right. Yeah. But it didn't feel like it. The DR. 
I don't know, maybe because there is no uh, steering dampener. Well, you're, you have been ride for a whole year. Yeah, at all, pretty but, much. Uh, you ride for a whole year, that's going to take its toll. When, uh, when I hit a section where the gravel is deeper or the sand is deeper, it's pucker time. <laughs> Can you show us that? There is that. <laughs> like this. <laughs> you know? It's just the front that feels... Vague Are you standing? Yeah. standing? It doesn't There's matter whether you stand or you don't. It doesn't matter. The first sure, it doesn't. Yeah. You jump off when you're standing. So, <laughs> so, so the way I calculated my uh, velocity was I was going to go just as fast that I'm still okay with crashing at that speed. And that, that was around 50 to 60 kilometers per hour. Yeah, but the thing is, I think Hi. the good speed was about did 80 he do it? and then things went... He did it? Can we hear? <laughs> Here, I can tell you what he's saying. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> well, he'll do it again, so we'll make sure we get it. We can't hear Chris, cool. so I'll just tell you what's happening. So, I'll be home in five minutes, honey. <laughs> no, there's no girls here. I love you. <laughs> Henrik's fault, he made me have a beer. Riley, yes, tell us our, no, your impressions. How do I get, uh, no, it's not good. Ah, it's good now. Tell us your impressions of the ride. Super out of shape. My winter training regimen. Of, You're not talking about yourself. I am. I'm talking about my winter training regimen of Costco chips <laughs> and Netflix watching. Apparently, is not the Paris Dakar training cool. regimen. Who says that? I don't know, but so now I was actually pretty sh shaky at the beginning. So it's cute. A parent, a Yet you were unable to break even like one so turn signal on your motorcycle. I was unable to. How break can you explain that? I didn't even fall over today. <laughs> Obviously, you were. Ooh, huh? What do we have here? Oh, yeah. It's a real man. Yeah. Who could take that bike off road? I would. I would. I wouldn't mind at all. <laughs> yeah, you. Fast. Yeah. I would do it as long as it wasn't mine. Yeah, no, exactly. A man in search of a muffler. <laughs>